One cold day in London, a man named William Barrett stepped to a lectern at a conference and said, brace yourself for five piping hot minutes of inertia. Then he began a recitation of each of the 415 colors in a paint swatch collection. Damson dream, dauphin, day room yellow, dead salmon, etc., etc., etc. The title of Mr. Barrett's talk was like listening to paint dry. And if you think it sounds like a boring talk at what must have been a pretty boring conference, you're absolutely right, because William Barrett was one of 20 speakers at the first annual boring conference. Not the first conference ever to be boring, but the first conference that actually titled itself a boring conference. For seven hours, a string of dreary experts, which, by which I mean experts in dreariness, they held forth on topics like the intangible beauty of car park roofs and personal reflections on the English breakfast and my relationship with bus routes. It was all the idea of James Ward. After hearing that something called the Interesting Conference had been canceled, he fired off a tweet that somebody ought to organize a boring conference. And the response was so energetic, boredom energizes some people, you see, he decided he'd do it. Fifty tickets were gone in seven minutes, and before long, James Ward himself was kicking off the day's events with a discussion of his necktie collection. It was accompanied by PowerPoint slides, just in case the topic wasn't intrinsically deadly enough. Is it telling that we live in a time when boredom has to be planned for and sought out? It's true there were a couple of years there during the pandemic when boredom might have come a little easier to us, but busyness seems to have made a full recovery, hasn't it? Interestingly, the concern about the scarceness of boredom is not new. Almost a century ago, a German architect named Siegfried, Siegfried Krakauer worried about the state of permanent receptivity that, get this, radio listening might produce in us. His remedy was extraordinary radical boredom. He recommended on a sunny afternoon when everyone is outside, one would do best to hang about the train station, or better yet, draw the curtains and surrender oneself to one's boredom on the sofa. Of course, Mr. Krakauer was writing long before Twitter and Instagram and the like. Nowadays, with a smartphone in hand, a couch in a darkened room, might be one of the least protected places from the assault of interestingness that one magazine writer says we suffer. Now, a preacher holding forth on the virtues of boredom is a little like Julia Child recommending butter. <laughs> Boredom's kind of our stock in trade, right? But the reason I bring up the subject today is because I think what the champions of boredom were really after is a change in the kind of attention we pay to the world. So was Jesus. And so was Isaiah. The distracted, it seems, will always be among us. So let's set aside the good advice of homiletics professors everywhere and consider two of our readings at once this morning. Let's see if their similarities or different differences might be instructive as we try to pay attention to the particulars of our lives and look for the presence of God within them, possibly discovering the way of wisdom as we do. Isaiah's prophecy was spoken to a people who've just had a very hard time. Jesus' is spoken to a people who are just about to have one. In Isaiah 65, Israel had recently returned from exile in Babylon, a hard time that lasted about 50 years, beginning with the siege of Jerusalem in 587 B.C. People were rounded up and carried away from their homeland, and the city was razed to the ground. When they returned years later, they were free, but there was almost nothing left of their previous lives. The city had been plundered, and Solomon's temple had been destroyed. But God, the prophet promised, was about to create a new heavens and a new earth. Not out of the watery chaos of Genesis 1, but out of the nothingness that Jerusalem had become during Israel's captivity. Isaiah's prophetic calling to change the kind of attention Israel was paying to their bleak surroundings. God was going to do a new thing, something that didn't just follow logically and predictably from their painful history. Joy, delight, 
long life, good labor, and peace were coming. Train your attention carefully, says Isaiah, not only on the tragic past or the bleak landscape, but on this empty place that God is about to fill up with life once again. Centuries later, in what's called the little apocalypse of Luke 21, history is about to repeat itself in a very unsettling way. The temple, the one Israel rebuilt in response to Isaiah's promise of God's new creation, that very temple is about to be destroyed again. The days will come, Jesus says, when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. In other words, things are about to fall apart. So train your attention carefully, he says. Yes, there will be signs and distractions, wars and famines and earthquakes that seem to all point toward an apocalypse you'll think you'll be able to understand and anticipate, but you won't. There will be plagues and persecutions and betrayals and imprisonments, but Jesus says, don't plan your defense in advance. You'll be given the words and the wisdom you need. To endure what's coming will not take clever planning, but clear-eyed attention to this moment, difficult as it may be. Train your attention on the here and now, whether a temple's about to be built or about to tumble down. The present, this is where the wisdom God provides is to be found. A poet named Christian Wyman once wrote, If Christianity is going to mean anything at all for us now, then then the humanity of God cannot be a half measure. God can't float over the chaos of pain and particles in which we are mired. Well, both Isaiah and Jesus insisted that God really was present in the chaos and particles of Israel, in their new life after the exile, and of the first Christians as they watched the Romans tear down that temple. Both prophets urged people to pay attention to the place where they stood and the moment that was unfolding. Because if God is with us at all in any meaningful way, it's not as some abstract principle or distant force, but in the lives we're actually living, in crumbling temples and audacious building projects, in lush vineyards and lousy crop returns, in typhoons and childbirth, in love and war and peace. That whichever that happens to be yours right now, is where God is. And that, whichever that happens to be yours, is the moment on which God needs you to train your attention. So what is your right now? And how might God be present to it or in it? Or put another way, what is it that distracts you from being present to the moment at hand? These kinds of questions aren't just for people about to build a temple or about to lose one. They're also for people worried today about a market collapse or climate change or the end of democracy tomorrow. Jesus isn't saying we should pretend such things could never happen. In fact, he said such things almost certainly will happen in one form or another. But he told us in so many ways not to waste today filling up barns with stuff we think we'll need for some other day. He told us we should live like lilies and sparrows, didn't he? Not worrying so much about tomorrow because today's trouble's enough for today. He told us, yes, there will be earthquakes and famines and wars in our future. But the best way to have the words and the wisdom for those days when they come is to be alert and attentive to this day to what's heartbreaking and hard about it, and to what's lovely and life-giving as well. But attentive enough to do the work we've been given to do now, which will almost surely include that practice of being still and listening and watching for God's wisdom. Well, the boring conference was canceled in 2020 and hasn't come back online. Maybe we got our fill of boredom during the long days of quarantine. But we're certainly back online, are we not? Which means we're barraged, maybe not only by armies and earthquakes, but also by information and gadgets and empty new forms of interestingness. 
So we may need more than ever to relearn that old art of boredom. Or maybe the art of prayer, which a wise monk once told me is always one part boredom. We may need enough emptiness in our days to be present to them, to be attentive, to be quiet and undistracted, at least enough to wait and watch for the wisdom that we need, which God only ever gives us in the midst of the pain and particles of the moment we're living in right now.